Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Theodore Grassus. I'm um, the Secretary General of uh, EVBB, which is the European Association of uh, Institutes for Vocational Training, which is one of the largest European umbrella associations for education and vocational training. During these difficult times, respect towards the Aegean population has been increased. COVID has forced us to think out of the box and analyze what we have done and what we should do in order to increase the quality of life and the active involvement of the elderly in the social and civic life. Erasmus Plus SSA Elder Care Project aims to be an answer to the above mentioned challenges. Adaptation to an aging society requires enhanced efforts from all in order to maintain all these people's social inclusion. It also requires creating age-friendly environments, including mainstreaming of services and commodities accessible to all. ICT is also essential that, as it enables integrated person-centered care with more focus on prevention, early detection, and independent living. Today, we are going to present our LD care approach for the creation of a pathway, not only for formal, but also for informal caregivers through education and training with two fresh market-driven curricula responding to the needs of this special demographic group, their families, but also their close ones. Within this context, a major question has emerged. How will the elderly care sector respond to these new challenges? How will informal and formal elderly caregiving adapt to these new fundamental changes? New challenges that have driven us forward. And here is the European Commission who has provided us with a new initiative. The Green Paper on the Gene is the most recent answer of the Commission tackling democratic, demographic and aging issues in a more structured context. We are going to have the opportunity to listen to the presentation of Mrs. Suica, the European Commissioner for Democracy and Demography regarding the Green Paper on Aging, which is currently under consultation. In our today's event, we are opening a discussion. I would rather say we are continuing a discussion where all major stakeholders have been invited. Eurocarers, the Age Platform, the European Aging Network, who were so kind and um, supported and co-organized uh, in order to organize this event as co-organizers. Senecura, a leader in the care sector and representatives of the academia have been invited to provide insights on the future of caregiving under the latest development. But first, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Jiri Horeshki, President of the European Energy Network, a colleague who became a friend and whose opinion, opinion I value the most. Yiri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Theodore, for the floor and for the work. Uh, thank you for uh, your nice words. Uh, uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, good morning. I'm happy that uh, the European Aging Network uh, uh, was not only a partner and part of the Elder Care Project, but also a partner of uh, at this uh, uh, conference. European Aging Network was founded in uh, uh, 1989, and uh, uh, I'm the president of this European association. We have members from 25 European countries representing the long-term care providers uh, for elderly. It was already mentioned that uh, elderly care was an uh, EU-supported project uh, and uh, has uh, uh, two main target groups, the informal caregivers, but also the professional caregivers. And there are uh, very interesting outputs and results of this uh, uh, activity that uh, we have been doing uh, uh, the last uh, years and months. Uh, there are two uh, uh, curricula, uh, training curricula for this uh, very important target groups, uh, uh, caregivers, informal caregivers, professional caregivers, to support the informal caregivers in what they are doing, but also to enable them to starting maybe a job after their close ones pass away, uh, being treated and uh, being provided the care. Another goal is on uh, was to enhance the qualification and skills of the professional caregivers. Uh, there is also one very interesting tool, a psychometric tool to test the mental capacity of elderly caregivers, uh, which uh, was created uh, in the frame of the project. And uh, it's very 
uh, interesting uh, to use for long-term care providers. And there are great other uh, useful results and outcomes. We know that the social sector is one of the fastest growing in Europe. Uh, it represents 5% of uh, the total workforce in Europe. And in the last six, seven years, there were over 2 million new uh, employees coming uh, to work uh, or starting to work uh, uh, in the social sector. So uh, it's one of the fastest growing sector. We also know that, that the demand for services for elderly is, uh, uh, is, is raising uh, from year to year. But we also realize that there is a growing bulk and burden of care for the families, uh, for the informal care deals. And all the care sector, either professional or informal, has been for the last year also due to the pandemic undergoing uh, a huge test and it's still under enormous strain. The care sector as we know it today uh, is uh, now uh, at a crossroad or is at least approaching a crossroad and there are different pathways to, to choose and to continue uh, uh, providing the care. We are talking about new models of living, independent living for elderly and services of elderly, a new uh, combination of, uh, of the mixtures of the professional and, and uh, informal uh, care ways and care pathways. There are new technologies and digitalization of social services uh, uh, coming and transforming the way that uh, uh, we do our work. There are also shortages of resources, financial resources, human resources, and the question of sustainability of uh, uh, the long-term care provision. We are also dealing with the problem of work migration in the social sector, uh, awaiting what this phenomenon is going to be in the next 5, 10, 15 years. But also uh, the division of the care, who is responsible and competent to do what and sufficient or insufficient support for the informal, part of the care, but also for the professional one. We have touched a lot of these topics during the project activity, and uh, they will be also mentioned during this final conference, and uh, uh, I am happy that uh, uh, the, the speakers uh, uh, will also uh, open these topics and uh, uh, enable the uh, discussion. So thank you very much, and I wish you, or I wish us all, a successful conference and event, and thank you for attention. And I give the floor back to Theodore. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much. Um, saying that, I would like to um, welcome the presentation of uh, the Green Paper on Aging by Mrs. Uh, Dubravka Shuika, which is uh, the European Commissioner for Democracy and uh, Dem um, Demography. So, um, Samir, please, if you may, thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to once again address an LD care event. As the first ever European Commission Vice President for Democracy and Demography, you can tell that this commission attaches great importance to the demographic issues affecting people's lives. In my role, I focus on the whole life cycle, from the rights of children to those of older people. One of the key demographic trends across our 27 member states is aging. I want to be clear. Aging is not just for older people. Everyone is impacted directly by the prospect of living a longer life, including the young. Aging brings both challenges and opportunities. It is important that we maintain this balance in all aspects of our policy making. Our aging European Union means that care is one of the sectors that will grow in importance. We must address the issue of care with an open mind and with innovative thinking. At various stages in our lives, we find ourselves either on the receiving end of care or giving care. In order to take our very first steps in life, someone had to first take care of us. As we age, we may need some form of care. Here, the space for responding to the challenges and opportunities of aging emerges. In the European Union, over the last 50 years, life expectancy at birth has increased by about 10 years for both men and women. This is a major achievement that is underpinned by the Union's social market economy. In the global context, we cannot say that Europe is the only continent with an aging population, but it is in Europe that the process is most advanced. To give you an example, today's median age in Europe of 42.5 years is more than double the figure for Africa. This gap is not showing any signs of narrowing. 
One of the most prominent features of aging is that the share and the number of older people will increase. Today, 20% of the population is about 65. By 2070, it will be 30%. Meanwhile, the share of people above 80 is expected to more than double, reaching 13% by 2070. That is a lot of change. Given these trends, we can see that the demand for health care and long-term care in the European Union is increasing. The common challenge for us all is to ensure access, affordability and quality care, as well as an adequate workforce in the care sector. The opportunity is also there to make aging a positive experience for us all, including caregivers and care receivers. This is part of the challenges and opportunities we address in the Green Paper on Aging. I want to emphasize the important message that aging brings both challenges and opportunities. This really drives me in my work because we must balance our policy making for everyone across the entire life cycle, making sure we leave no one behind. This is why on the 27th of January we launched an EU-wide discussion on aging through our Green Paper. I take this opportunity to ask for your support in raising awareness about the public consultation on the Green, on, on the green Paper. This Green Paper is open until the 21st of April. I encourage a wide and de deep debate and hope that all of you present today will contribute further. In the Green Paper, we look at how we lay the foundations for a full life in the early years and how we make the most of our working lives as adults. We are exploring the new opportunities and challenges for the growing needs of an aging population. All these stages require us to look at issues such as health, care and pensions, active aging and the capacity of social protection systems to deal with an aging population. We will look at intergenerational solidarity and responsibility, impacts on the labor market and the economy, and of course, education and skills. Aging is multidimensional. We need to ensure intergenerational responsibility and solidarity. We have a strong territorial angle in the paper because certain challenges are reinforced at the regional and local level. We plan to look more closely at issues such as loneliness, social isolation, mental health, economic resilience and, of course, long-term care. There is much for us to discuss and debate. We must grasp the economic opportunities and the innovative character of silver economy. I want to expand a bit more on the silver economy as I believe it is a key feature in helping to develop the care sector. Older people are not a homogeneous group. They have diverse needs, preferences and opportunities throughout the course of their lives. How can we best harness the opportunities presented by an aging population? Here we can show some creativity and new thinking. What comes to mind is the idea to use demographic change, in this case aging, as the spark for creating new developments such as innovative technologies, products and services that the silver economy is capable of generating. The silver economy, meaning the shift in demand for products and services that reflects the specific needs and preferences of older people, is expected to grow by about 5% a year to 5.7 trillion euro in 2025. If ranked among sovereign nations, the European silver economy would be the third largest economy in the world. This would put it behind only the United States and China. It will continue to grow. It is vital that we harness its concrete economic potential and innovative character, including when it comes to care. The silver economy has the potential to provide employment opportunities and economic growth in the Union in various sectors, especially for the health and long-term care sectors. It can drive innovation in high-quality health and social and digital services. It can stimulate innovation in the creation of smart homes that support independent living. In the same way, assistive technologies, personal and automated mobility and banking can all be stimulated by the increasing and varied demands of the silver economy. 
The silver economy can open up new job opportunities in sectors other than care, like in tourism. Increasing numbers of older people will be fit and eager to travel. They will choose to learn new skills or work for longer. Scientific and medical innovations will also boost opportunities for technology developers and highly skilled health staff and carers. A host of SMEs and startups are working in the sector, leading the way in innovative products. In this case, we are limited only by our imagination. I'm convinced that LDCare has grasped into the importance of the silver economy, creating new standards that answer to the demand for tech literate elderly care professionals is key and an important step towards harnessing the potential of the silver economy. Your work to improve the key competencies and skills of caregivers is vital to answering the varied care demands of an aging population. There is much untapped potential when it comes to the atypical or undeclared elderly caregivers, and we must strive to rectify this. Education and training in ICT tools and health applications puts both caregivers and care receivers on the path towards a more caring, more responsive, more innovative approach to aging. Dear ladies and gentlemen, demographic trends are key to responsible and responsive policy making in democracies. It is a matter of intergenerational fairness that policymakers cater to the needs for, of all generations in a sustainable way. Addressing aging as both a challenge and an opportunity is the way to harness the full potential of this key demographic trend, including when it comes to the care sector. Let us harness the opportunity together. Please remember to contribute to the public consultation on the Green Paper. We need your views to make sure that the debate and resulting policy response is as comprehensive as possible. I want to thank you for your collaboration. Thank you very much. Um, I would like also to thank, um, through this uh, floor, Mrs. Uh, Suika for her kindness to support our project both uh, today and through a message that has been um, uploaded on our uh, website. It is really important to have this uh, support from the European Commission. Saying that, I would also like to thank um, Eva Maidel, who is uh, a member of the European Parliament and also president of the European Movement International. We contacted her and uh, asked her to share her views and her opinion um, after we have presented here the LD Care EU campaign. So um, I would like us uh, to have a look in this uh, short um, congratulatory remarks of uh, Eva Maidel. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a pleasure to virtually be with you today. I am very glad we are acknowledging the excellent work done uh, by the European Association of Institutes for Vocational Training as part of the LD Care EU campaign. As we gather here today, I think we can see how difficult the COVID situation across our continent is. And certainly it is not as optimistic as we may have hoped it would be at this point in the year. Some member states are seeing a resurgence of a third wave, new variants and less than ideal vaccine rollout. I think this pandemic has the impact on every one of us. Every European has lost something, whether that is their job or their business or worst of all, a loved one. But if there is one group that we all know had been impacted tremendously by this pandemic, it is the elderly. Amidst the pandemic, I think we all realized that we need to ensure that caregivers who take care of the elderly have the best possible qualifications and trainings. After all, when we say elderly or talk about the LD care campaign, we need to remember that these are our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents. They're the ones who have always been there for us in the good, but also in the bad times. They have taken care of us having those sleepless nights themselves in order to make sure that their children sleep tight at night. So that's why I think it goes without saying that the elderly across Europe deserve the highest quality care. 
And the question is, how do we ensure that? So this is where I would like to commend EVBB and all other partners who support this project, including the European Commission on the very launch of this campaign to upskill and reskill caregivers for the elderly. I'm really proud to be supporting the Daily Care European campaign and I especially like to commend you for your focus on upskilling through education and training in ICT and healthcare applications. I think training in digital skills is relevant to healthcare providers, not only to provide better care for the elderly, but also more importantly, um, to give opportunities um, for the mobility of caregivers themselves. Um, in my work as a member of the European Parliament, I have always been very active and vocal about the need to upskill and reskill across our continent. And traditionally, I talk about this in a more business context, but the question of skills is just as relevant in many other sectors, including healthcare and elderly care. And addressing the issue of reskilling and skilling up is, I think, necessary today and not so much in the distant future. I can assure you that um, myself, but also colleagues in the Parliament are very much working on this and we stand ready to deliver. When crafting future legislation, for example, I think we would always continue to take a more holistic approach and make sure that we look at all sectors where upskilling and reskilling could actually benefit our society. And this is why I think that campaign like yours help raise awareness um, and also bring attention to certain sectors that perhaps we do not traditionally think of them uh, when talking about upskilling, but ones that are crucial nonetheless. So thank you very much for putting this issue on the European agenda. You can count on me as a reliable partner for your calls and I'm grateful to be able to address you today. Um, just to finish, I would like to congratulate once again EVBB um, and LD Care for the work they're doing uh, to really foster, to update and standardize the skills and professionalism of caregivers across our union. Um, in order for us not just to sleep well at night, knowing that our dearest parents or grandparents or great grandparents are well taken care of and are safe, but in this way, we do something that is also very beneficial for society as a whole. So I wish every success um, to this event and I look forward to our future cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, a reliable partner indeed. Um, always there, participating in our events and uh, sharing her views and opinions in uh, all the activities uh, that we are implementing. But saying that, um, Mr. Yiri Horeski, Yiri has already mentioned the main areas that uh, the LD Care project has um, touched, but uh, we would like to go a little bit deeper on that by asking uh, Mrs. Evanthea Vayuli, another Eva, uh, to uh, present uh, the project. Um, Eva Vayuli is uh, the project manager of uh, LD Care and also a colleague at uh, ACME, a vet provider, which is the lead partner of this project. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you, Theodore. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. I think that uh, this final conference is the best way to close uh, Eldicure Project. And thank you, EVBB, for organizing this. Uh, let me share my screen. So, uh, what is Eldicure, first of all? LDCAR is an Erasmus Plus Sector Skills Alliance project uh, uh, focusing on uh, the elderly caregivers, not only the typical, but also the atypical ones, as uh, Mr. Grasos and Mr. Horeki uh, mentioned before. The lead partner of the consortium is ACME SA. The project started on November uh, 2018 and is going to, to end uh, in one month from now. Uh, the total budget of uh, the project is approximately 700,000 700, euros and the partnership uh, consists of 12 partners in five EU countries. Specifically, our partnership consists of uh, educational partners that are responsible for, let's say, the academic uh, perspective of uh, the healthcare project 
uh, from sectoral partners that are responsible for uh, the employability and uh, the labor market uh, side of the project and the supporting partners. Uh, let me give one minute in order to mention uh, the partners uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, very important because all of us were uh, con uh, convinced to, to the elder project. A University of Malaga in Spain, BQS in Germany, ACME and Metropolitan College in Greece, Staffordshire in UK and of course CVBB that is operating in Brussels. In sectoral partners we have ASSTE in Spain, CMOP in Greece, APSS in Czech Republic and Age Concern in UK. Finally, our supporting partners is Aquin in Germany, that is an accreditation body responsible for the quality assurance of our project and the certification of our curricula. Skybridge, that is uh, an IT partner from Greece, responsible for the construction and the development of uh, our platform. And of, of course, a European Aging Network, that is uh, an associated partner to the consortium, but they are supporting us from the day one uh, for all the dissemination and communication activities. Uh, the objective of Eldicare, as Mrs. Madel said, is of course to foster, update and standardize the employability of caregivers. Moreover, we want to rethink and rebrand the elderly care uh, by combining traditional approaches with modern uh, ones to enhance the skills of both professionals and atypical caregivers and strengthen the exchange of knowledge and cooperation between the labor market and the training institutes. Our target groups. Of course, we target to the caregivers uh, that are going to be benefit through our uh, two fresh curricula, to the elders themselves, since they are going to receive uh, high quality services from trained and certified professionals, we aim to enterprises and organizations working with elders that are going to have access not only to a pool of well-trained candidates, but also to these uh, two curricula. And finally, of course, our target group is policymakers, since at the end of the day, we aim at the shrinking of the gray market, the improvement of services for the elderly citizens, the training of the workforce and the development of an ICT approach uh, since we live in a digital era. Uh, as Mrs. Dubravska said, the aging population brings not only challenges but opportunities to the Europe. So uh, during our project, we identified some challenges and we tried to, to make them opportunities for all. So uh, at first, we, we were trying to identify who is mentally suitable for this sensitive occupation. Of course, I'm mentioning to the atypical caregivers, since the professionals are uh, trained and uh, tested and certified already. So we designed a psychometric tool focused on uh, the atypical caregivers. Uh, in this moment, I would like to clarify the term atypical. Uh, it includes both the atypical, let's say the uh, caregivers that provide services, but are, they are not paid for these services, and the informal uh, ones, uh, such as the, the grandson or the granddaughter that taking care of uh, the grandma. Uh, this uh, is our target group, and of course the professionals are already working in the field. Um, uh, the second challenge we identified is uh, the needs and skills that there, is, uh, there are in shortage. So we created a self-assessment uh, tool uh, in order to exactly identify these needs and skills. Moreover, uh, the response to the demands of uh, both well-trained and less equipped caregivers was a challenge. So we created not only one, but uh, two fresh uh, curricula. Uh, furthermore, uh, we wanted to ensure tech lit literacy among the elderly care workers, so we included general ICT training in our curriculum. Finally, uh, there was a need uh, of validate for validation of the new skills acquired, so we created a certification scheme. 
Uh, let me present you some milestones of um, our healthcare project. Of course, I would be able to uh, to talk you for the whole day uh, for the activities and the deliverables we have in our project, but I will focus on three milestones. Of course, the psychometric tool, the self-assessment tool, and the development of the two curricula. First of all, uh, the psychometric tool consists of 25, 27 sorry, questions. Uh, it takes approximately 20 minutes to be completed. Um, you are tested in five categories, and there are four categories of results, low, average, high, and very high. Which are the categories that you are tested in this psychometric tool? Uh, these are the burden, because we all know that uh, the work pressure, sometimes we take it uh, with us, our home. Um, it's the coping, the coping mechanisms that uh, uh, enhance the resilience of the caregivers. The professionalism, of course, of the people that uh, provide the, the, their services. The empathy, since uh, emotional intelligence and empathy are very important for this occupation. And finally, anxiety, how your stress uh, affects you uh, during your uh, daily routine. Uh, here you can find the psychometric tool, this is the link. Unfortunately, I'm not able to show you uh, the, the tool right now because um, I have taken the survey once in order to test it, so I cannot do it uh, twice for, from the same IP address. Uh, but, of course, I urge you to, to visit this tool, navigate to the tool, and, um, of course, answer to the survey because I think that we all have uh, some uh, older member of our family that we might uh, need to take care of sometimes in the future. Um, here, I would like to say that before Okay, we have 160 respondents so far in the psychometric tool, but before uh, these responses, we have tested the psychometric tool in professional caregivers in order to have a reference uh, group uh, for, for the results, for comparing the results. Uh, from these results, we can see that um, although empathy, anxiety, and professionalism levels are high for both the professional and the typical caregivers, the atypical caregiver, uh, caregiver sorry, need to be upskilled in the burden and the coping uh, skills. And I think that this is something that you learn how to do it by practicing it. Uh, the second uh, milestone of our project is the self-assessment tool. Uh, it consists of 18 questions, take approximately 10 minutes to be completed, and it's available in five languages. Uh, here I have again the, the link for you to navigate to the uh, assessment tool. I would like to say that this uh, response to, to this uh, self-assessment tools uh, feed us with uh, the results in order to know which uh, modules and units we have to develop for our curricula. Of course, some focus groups and interviews as well, but this tool was very important to find the gaps and the skills that are needed uh, for our curriculum. Uh, the final milestone is the development of uh, our two new curricula. The first is for atypical caregivers and the second for professional ones. Uh, the, the logic behind it is pretty much the same. There are some uh, extra modules in the professional one, uh, such as legal rights and, uh, and uh, GDPR. Of course, the content uh, has uh, many differences because professional caregivers um, already know some things, so this is more um, uh, simple and um, with more uh, technical uh, terms, etc., for the professional ones, but it's very uh, understandable for the atypical caregivers and pretty much uh, easy for, for you to complete. Uh, of course, a very basic component to the curricula is the practical learning. At first, we had uh, envisaged a WBL, a work-based learning for our curricula, but um, due to COVID situa situation in the partner countries, 
we won't be able to to send learners for um, uh, to host the organization for practical learning but we found some alternatives and now we are implementing uh, webinars and meetings with professionals in order for the learners to know uh, which is the situation exactly today especially with uh, COVID-19. Here is the, the link for the platform. This time I will open the link and I will try to Okay, um, maybe I'm not able to, to share it uh, without stop sharing my existing screen, but I will try it. Uh, could the administrators please tell me if you are seeing my screen? Your website didn't open. We still saw your website. Okay, now, now, yes, now, it now may you're be there. Open. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I will sign in with my credentials, but uh, since you are not enrolled, uh, you can sign up to the platform. Uh, here you can see the two curricula the one for atypical caregivers and the one for professional ones. Uh, let's select the first. and say it as a learner. Uh, there is a questionnaire, a pre-course survey for us to, to gather some data, uh, such as gender, uh, occupational background, educational background, only for, for statistics reasons. Uh, you can see the weeks with uh, four to five modules in uh, each week. This is uh, the whole uh, course of uh, four, four weeks long. Uh, I will open one module in order for you to, to see where is the, what is the training material. So useful care technologies, very important for a project as well. You can see the description of uh, the module or of the unit, a video lecture accompanied with uh, its uh, transcript, and of course the reading material uh, an extra training material for you to download it and uh, study it at your own time. Moreover, the platform contains some features uh, such as the discussion uh, sector uh, where you can discuss with the moderators and the trainers of the curriculum and of course your progress. You can see uh, how you um, what progress have you noted in the curriculum of course now it's my account so i don't have any progress but you will be able to see yours and here uh, where now it's the view uh, grading uh, you will be able to to see your certificate download it and print it of course you you will get your certificate as well so this is the platform I will uh, open again my PowerPoint. Uh, I would like to, to present you some results of the registration we had. Of course, uh, we, knew, we knew that, but uh, we are sure now that uh, women are more than men in the caregiving uh, occupations. And here's some data about the age of uh, the atypical caregivers and the professional ones. As we can see, uh, the generation Z is uh, dominating in the atypical caregivers, while the professional ones are from generation X. Of course, I would like to mention the certification of the curricula, and this is the first time within an, uh, within an Erasmus Plus project that we managed to have international certification. So our two curricula have been reviewed by an expert committee um, and received international certification based on the European Quality Assurance Framework for higher and vocational training. Aquin was in charge of this uh, procedure and now we can uh, say that uh, with the certification now we respond to the demand for tech literacy, we improve the access to lifelong learning, we increase You are muted. 
I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry for this. Okay. Um, very sorry for this. It was with the sharing. Sorry, Eva, my fault. I it's let okay. some new participants in and muted you accidentally. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, so I guess that it was, it was my... It was a nice way to, to mention that uh, you are out of time almost. <laughs> Okay, I, I will not, uh, <laughs> I will end it. Um, I would like to say that um, according to the results of our platform, women are more than men in the caregiving profession. Uh, atypical um, caregivers are more in Generation Z, while professional ones are more in Generation X. And uh, now I would like to focus on mentioning the certification of the curricula because it's the first time within an Erasmus Plus project that we managed to uh, acquire international certification based on the European Quality Assurance Framework for Higher and Vocational Training. Uh, Aquin, our partner Aquin, was in charge of this procedure. So I can say now uh, that we are certified and we respond to the demand for tech literacy, we improve access to lifelong learning, we increase transparency and recognition of qualifications, and we foster employability of young people. Uh, in what's next, I would uh, be able to, to, to keep talking, but uh, there is only one uh, thing that I would like to mention and ask for your help. This is sustainability. This is a very important project. It has to be sustained. Uh, so please do register in the platform, do disseminate it with your colleagues, friends or family members in order to, to be trained uh, as uh, uh, caregivers and do contact us. We may have uh, more ideas, we, have, we may have uh, answers for your questions, so uh, contact us. This is my email and of course this is the website of Elidica Project for you to, to navigate it. Uh, all the tools that I have mentioned, uh, you, can found them, uh, you can find them in this uh, website. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, regarding questions, um, we have some in the chat, but um, I would like to move uh, forward um, and uh, leave the questions um, to be answered at the end of the session, since okay. we also have the very interesting presentation of uh, Dr. Peter Kevin, who is also going to um, speak about the curricula. So I think we could summarize everything at the end of uh, this uh, uh, first um, session. But now I would like um, to welcome uh, Mr. Ad Koster, the first statutory vice president of EAN, who is going to present us the consequences and impact of COVID-19 in the elderly care sector. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I hope, uh, thank you, Theodore. Nice to see you again a long time ago. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, do a uh, short presentation about uh, the consequences and impact of COVID-19. I also have a presentation and uh, it's my first time to share the content. So I hope I will succeed with it. But well, we will see. Uh, now I must look. And I hope you can see my uh, presentation now. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. Uh, well, first to tell some small thing about myself. I'm from the Netherlands. I was born in the, in the, in the region where they grow the, the tulips, as you can see in my shirt. I'm proud of it. I'm a member of a supervisory board and you can see what, what my uh, background is. So that's maybe uh, enough for this moment. Uh, I would like to introduce the European Aging Network. You saw our president, Jerzy Horecki, uh, at the beginning of this uh, uh, conference. Uh, I would like to share uh, some experience with our members about COVID-19, uh, some dilemmas, lessons learned, and I will end with some conclusions. So, uh, European Aging Network, uh, Yersi already told something, so I can make it short here too. We have more than 10,000 care providers who are members of 
of our association. We are in 27 European countries uh, represented and uh, 1 million service seniors by our uh, care providers. Um, uh, you could say we are all across uh, Europe, uh, as you can see. Um, as I told you, um, uh, I would like to share some, uh, some experiences from our members with uh, COVID-19 in the last year. Uh, we had uh, four uh, digital uh, meetings with uh, a lot of our members uh, in a lot of uh, European countries. And we made uh, 10 issues. Uh, I will um, uh, tell something about all those 10 issues, uh, what uh, the experience is of our uh, members. For uh, information in, in intelligence, uh, they experienced uh, a lack of correct and reliable information from public authorities. Uh, uh, there were difficulties to document and disseminate uh, best practices. Uh, sometimes there was inadequacy ad of communication with and between authorities. Um, differences in statements uh, from policies on national, federal or regional level. Uh, sometimes inconsistency of measures, uh, frequent changes of measures and recommendations. Uh, a lack of thought towards long-term consequences and the impact on the social services and the elderly care sector. And I must mention that uh, we are talking about experiences in almost 20, 27 uh, different European countries with different culture, different systems. So in one country it was maybe better organized than in, than in another country. So it's, it's a mix of experiences, I must uh, say. Well, but uh, in regard to media and dogmas and prejudices, what we have experienced, experienced is that uh, there was an invisibility of the social services sector and service uh, users in public discourse. Um, we saw a lack of knowledge uh, by uh, a lot of journalists about social services, sometimes also stigmatization of contaminated people, older persons or residents and residential care. And sometimes uh, dramatic media coverage uh, with negative effect on the public uh, who may be less willing to use formal care services. We saw for instance, also in the Netherlands, that uh, people who uh, were uh, got a license to start living in a in a nursing home, they were uh, saying, "No, please, uh, I don't want to go there because, uh, yeah, I saw in the media all kind of uh, measures that uh, that's why I don't want to go now to the uh, nursing home." So, so we had a lot of empty uh, rooms in uh, in nursing homes. For the procedures and standards, I could say that there was a big dilemma between the quality of care versus the quality of life. Um, there was a diversity and sometimes confusion of instructions given. Um, um, guidelines and procedures are mostly focused on safety, not on well-being and quality of life. And if you look at protection and prevention, we had a lot of challenges in terms of training of staff on service provision during the public health pandemic. Uh, social services were not a priority in the beginning in the supply of uh, the personal protection uh, equipment and also later in testing. And it was difficult to provide face-to-face -face care services safely in times of this pandemic. Um, over-medicalization, uh, well, we saw that most attention was to the um, intensive care units and there was less attention for pre and post hospitalization. Uh, there, were, there was insufficient attention to social aspects of the crisis, uh, especially the provision of social services. Um, then for finance and uh, funding, uh, well, it was a big, uh, big uh, change also for uh, finance and funding because, uh, well, we had uh, a lot of uh, costs because of uh, we had to buy a lot of PPE when it, when it was there. We had to buy it, of course. 
We had to take a lot of measures uh, for safety. Uh, we had uh, less uh, income because people didn't uh, use uh, nursing homes uh, or, for instance, day activity centers or other uh, services we provide. Uh, so it was more costs, less income. Uh, we had a lot of people who became sick also from staff or had to stay at home because of quarantine. Uh, so it was uh, very uh, difficult. Uh, it is still a very difficult time. And in some countries, uh, the government and insurance companies support uh, the social services and elderly care sector. But in other countries in Europe, it's very difficult. Uh, there is more emphasis on uh, funding and finance for uh, the industry, for uh, all kind of profit uh, uh, companies, but uh, less for uh, not-for-profit and for elderly care uh, uh, organizations. And as I said, uh, staffing was also a big problem uh, because of uh, uh, sickness leave, uh, but also quarantine uh, uh, measures. Uh, we had to uh, find uh, a lot of people uh, let's call them reservists, uh, ex-care professionals, people from other, uh, from the other branches. For instance, people who worked in restaurants and pubs uh, were asked to, to help us. But also in the Netherlands, for instance, people who, are, who worked at the national uh, uh, air um, flight company, uh, they didn't have work anymore because there were there were no uh, airplanes uh, uh, working, uh, and they could uh, uh, start uh, to support us in our sector. Um, about discrimination and human rights, yeah, we had a lot of discussions about uh, several measures. For instance, the first uh, lockdown in several countries that no one could visit their their grandparents or their partners or their parents anymore in. In nursing homes, it was uh, a big discussion because, uh, yeah, what about the um, the freedom of people who live in nursing homes? Uh, when you lived at home, you could still uh, get uh, uh, visitors uh, of your family, but living in a nursing home, it was uh, different. It took a lot of discussion. Uh, about technology and ICT, well, there is... Uh, there were maybe some problems uh, with uh, the implementation of uh, existing, existing solutions. There were discussions about privacy versus safety. But uh, I can say that there, are, there, is also, there are also very good experiences with more use of technology. Uh, maybe in the past, uh, not everybody was very enthusiastic about uh, uh, using technology to, for instance, have conversations with your family, uh, uh, with your laptop or iPad. But uh, now in these uh, last year, it is a big uh, grow of uh, use of technology and people are uh, more satisfied and more willing to, to use it. And for the last uh, point is the housing, uh, the logistics and service models. Well, uh, it's the same as uh, I already mentioned, uh, uh, the lockdown, people couldn't uh, um, visit their family. And it, it, it has to, uh, the, one of the reasons is that people live as a kind of family in, in, in a nursing home, as you all know. And uh, well, some family of these uh, residents uh, were very keen on, please uh, make it very safe for my my parents or grandparents or partner and the other part of the family, they said, oh, but it's not good. Uh, they are alone. Uh, it's, it's not good if they don't get visitors. So there were big discussions and probably looking at the future, uh, maybe when we uh, build new uh, uh, nursing facilities, we should uh, think about uh, maybe other way of building it uh, with less groups, maybe more uh, uh, possibilities for people to go out of their room out, outside and they don't have to walk through the whole nursing home to, to, to go out. To go out. Uh, so it's, it means something uh, for architecture in the uh, future. Um, I would say that uh, the most um, uh, dilemmas are the most uh, uh, tough dilemmas were 
about uh, care uh, versus uh, cure. Uh, uh, care is also um, well-being, uh, but it's also uh, about the care sector in, uh, versus the cure sector. Hospitals got more in, uh, attention, but we had to, to do our work too. And maybe in future we, we need more cooperation. We had a, a, a dilemma uh, when we had a shortage of uh, protection uh, equipment versus safe labor conditions. We had to send our staff to situations without enough PPE. It was very difficult. The individual freedom of our residents, our clients versus the collective protection when there was a total lockdown. And what I said, safety is of course important, but well-being, meeting uh, family and friends is important too. Well, we, we learned a lot of lessons. We, I can maybe say that you can find us it back on our uh, uh, website, uh, ean.care, because I see that I don't have uh, much time anymore. Um, but uh, we have uh, uh, learned a lot of lessons about communication, uh, about uh, the concept of good health, that it must include, uh, include uh, not only physical, but also mental, spiritual and social aspects. We have to work on better co-production and cooperation, cooperation between all the care organizations in your region, not only elderly care, but also the general practitioners, the hospitals, what can we uh, uh, do for each other? Uh, we learned from that and uh, also in future with these lessons, we can um, um, make it even better. And uh, it's good that we know each other now better than before. I think the production and management of stock uh, uh, for, of PPE must become better. Maybe we must produce in the European Union more than only be dependent on other parts of the world. Uh, we must think about that for the future. The finance and funding must be more uh, adequate, uh, not only for um, uh, government support for companies, but also for uh, uh, care organizations. We must have more attention for the labor force. Uh, that's why we love the LD Care pro uh, project, because I think it's one of the ways to uh, to, to get more people working in our sector. And what I already said, uh, the future housing must be more pandemic uh, proof. So my conclusions, um, I think the experience with COVID-19 uh, is a wake up call for uh, the labor market uh, of care sector. Uh, we uh, experienced now the last year, uh, how a big problem it can be when your staff is not uh, we, when we don't when we don't have enough staff because they are sick at home or we need more uh, people to um, to support our residents and our clients. Uh, we use more technology, but we have to think about how we can uh, attract more people uh, to work in our sector or to work in another way so that we can cooperate more with informal care with the family, etc. Elderly care sector is important. We have shown that and it must be treated as such. Uh, the cooperation between all parts of health sector, I already, I already mentioned it. And I think all the parts of government policy in all the countries and also in the European Union, like for instance, housing and public space uh, are necessary for a more effective pandemic policy also in the future. So uh, government must uh, uh, stimulate that the, the building of new nursing homes or uh, care facilities must be uh, 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 designed and, and, and made with our uh, pandemic experience in our heads, uh, uh, what we learned from it. And these are the most important conclusions. And uh, for the rest, I can uh, say that you can uh, see it in uh, our website uh, back. Um, and now I try to come back. I've stopped share. Yes, there I am again. And I hope uh, it was uh, uh, interesting for you. And thank you for that. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. And um, I would like to, um, I noted, and I would like to keep as a note, uh, the fact that uh, new protocols uh, had to be designed during this uh, challenging period. And also new challenges uh, for upskilling of uh, the people that are 
engaged in the elderly care uh, sector um, has been uh, highlighted. And uh, based on that, I would uh, welcome the notification uh, that uh, Joao Santos uh, has uh, shared in the chat room about the fact that uh, the Centers of Vocational Excellence could be a new way of um, upskilling um, people who are engaged in the aging population and uh, tackle all these challenges that are uh, very, very uh, vivid and among us uh, during these difficult times. As you know, the new Erasmus Guide has been published. It is available online. And uh, the deadline for the cover is uh, the 7th of uh, September, 2021. Um, thank you again. Um, and hereby, I would uh, like to welcome Peter Kevin, Dr. Peter Kevin, um, a fellow friend from uh, the Academia um, from the Staffordshire University. Peter, the floor is yours. Peter, you can unmute yourself. Oh, oh there we go. Okay, now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, a few moments ago, I, I was still muted by the organizers, so I couldn't do that. But now, thank you uh, for this opportunity, Theodore, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I may be a little bit short uh, this time because I know that uh, you've been listening to a lot of presentations and you might already be wanting your cup of coffee. But I uh, hope I'll be interesting enough for the moment. Uh, I'm just going to go over to my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Theodore, can you? Yes, yes. Yes, good, great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, a little bit about me first. Um, I am Professor of Values in Health and Social Care, uh, which means, as you can imagine, I have a particular interest in social care. And I'm at Staffordshire University, which is in a depressed part of the UK. Uh, in an area which does not have a strong tradition of education. So we have a particular emphasis on educational opportunities for people with no educational background, which is obviously why I'm so interested in elder care. My own specialist is in also in health equalities in ageing and how they are influenced by social policy. Um, so, for example, at the moment, I'm looking very hard at a voluntary care network in Brazil, which is absolutely enormous. It had 25,000 volunteers, and it makes a huge difference to the caring or the care for older people in their communities in remote parts of the country. And I also teach a whole range of students who are going to be our future carers and health professionals. So that's my involvement. So when I look at the current situation with an eye to the inequalities question, then this is the first thing I find. You'll be familiar with the Eurobarometer data. Um, and this is from 2017, so it's already quite old, of course. But what it shows there is the level of um, internet-based healthcare services across Europe. And I think one of the thing interesting things about this is how much variation there is. So in some wealthy countries like Germany, for example, uh, there's not at this stage very much internet-based healthcare services. Whereas in some others with lower incomes um, like Greece, it's clearly being used much more. So it's not about the economic prosperity of the country that's affecting this. What does seem to be affecting it is the political policy being used. So Sweden, for example, very early on, decided that the best way to give health care to its population in scattered places was to use ICT. Whereas some other countries have tried to retain a personal approach. So across Europe, there's a lot of inequalities, a lot of variation in how ICT is being used. But within that, there are some things that are constant. So one of the things that is constant is that older people have less access to ICT than any other proportion of the population, which means that if you are extending ICT into elderly care, one of the first questions you've got is, well, who can actually access this care? 
and how is that affecting the way it's being used. Another thing is that ICT has the potential to increase inequalities in care because the same people who are already unable to access good care tend to be the people who have problems with ICT. So we need to be careful about this. The same is true for carers. Um, a lot of carers are older people. So in a 2007 study, half of them were over 55. Now I'm interested in what Ava was saying earlier, that our students on the elder care course are not in that age range. So we may still have some work to do to catch those people. But then it was only a pilot. Uh, another thing is that a lot of uh, external, atypical carers, informal carers, are un uneducated. Most of them, in fact, are educated only to primary level. They have only between three and six years of education. And if they have come from other parts of the world, then they may be unfamiliar with the care system. So they also may be excluded by ICT-based care. So, we, somebody else has mentioned this uh, already, uh, that we have risks and challenges, opportunities and challenges, or as I put it, opportunities and risks. Uh, ICT-based health can give us a fantastic opportunity because it can be very cheap compared to face-to-face -face health. It can be very effective because it's possible to get better information to the carers. And it can be very professional. So that even people in areas a long way from a city and areas where there's not much resources are able to use it. So that is the opportunity that we have. And that's what elder care could be helping us to develop. However, as I said, there is a risk that if we don't um, roll out our ICT services in the right way, they will end up increasing inequalities, that the best services will go to the people who already have good services. And the people who have no services still won't get the benefit from these. So how do we change our risks into opportunities? Well, the first thing is that the pandemic, as we all know, has changed the way that we use electronic services. So um, there has been, in, according to a recent study, a 40% year-on-year increase to January. In the 12 months of January, the increase in the use of the internet was 40%. As well as that, coverage has been extended. So I think we all have relatives who'd never used their, their computers for a Zoom call before. They'd never used them for, for communicating with other people. And now they're doing that. My 93-year-old father learned how to use Zoom so that he could communicate with his friends and relatives. And that is a tremendous opportunity for us to extend ICT-based care. Uh, we also um, know that training has a strong effect on the use of services. So that if we can roll out training like elder care, both to older people and to their carers, then that's going to make a big difference to the way in which ICT-based care is delivered. A relatively little amount of training goes a long way. So this is about elderly people rather than their carers, but um, a recent study found that if elderly people just participate in a little training activity, it can be a very small thing, it can be half an hour, uh, then for at least a month afterwards, their use of services increases dramatically. We assume that that effect is carried over, but the study hasn't yet been done. So we know that older people and their carers respond well to training, and that given the proper support, it will affect their use of ICT. So of course, that brings us to the elder care project. And these messages have been given before, but the elder care project will clearly benefit carers in all the ways which uh, Ava mentioned earlier on today. 
but also the project will benefit service users, which of course is the purpose behind this. Obviously, service users are going to be benefited by the fact that carers have more knowledge and more skills. But I also think that we can expect to see what has been called a washover effect, which is that if, if the carers are skilled in the use of ICT, then the service users are going to become skilled as well, because carers um, encourage and support service users into accessing services directly themselves. So I believe that the Elder Care project has the potential to improve accesses to services and information by older people in all sorts of contexts and in all sorts of ways. And we've only just started to see the, uh, the benefits of that effect. But what next? Well, the obvious thing that we are facing at the moment is the pandemic. I hope that in all of our countries, we will start to emerge from lockdown measures and distancing measures quite soon. Um, however, our economies have been damaged. Both our formal and informal economies have been damaged. There are costs to be dealt with. People have spent a long time in social isolation and may be slow to emerge from that. And that raises the question about what is now deliverable across Europe. I think elder care has some potential here. Elder care could help us to provide a stable and well supported workforce at a time when a lot of other things are changing and the economies are, of our countries are quite fragile. But also there's a question about how the workforce of atypical and informal carers will also change. For example, by a reduction in international travel. Uh, and by a reduction in some career pathways in other sectors and increases in unemployment. So will elder care provide also a route for the newly unemployed or those who newly find themselves in caring situations to adjust rapidly to a changed situation? I hope so. It's too early to tell at the moment, but I hope that um, Elder care will provide a range of tools with which we can adjust to the crisis that we have been through. That's all I have for you. I hope that has been useful and interesting for you though. Thank you, Peter, um, for your uh, presentation and also for the insights. Um, I do agree that uh, ICT and uh, its um, expansion of use is going to also increase the potentials for the elderly um, caregiving sector. By saying that, I would like to, let's say, steal two or three minutes of your time by um, providing the questions uh, that have been raised uh, during the presentations. Um, I would like to combine all together into one, um, in, into one question addressed mainly to Mrs. Evanthia Vayuli and also to you, Peter, as uh, you were also involved in the implementation of the project. And, of course, also to uh, Jiri uh, Horeski. So the main question was um, about the, um, adapti uh, the potential of uh, adapti uh, adaptability of the modules, if they can be used um, from vet providers, if uh, some of the, of, of the training modules can be used and not all of them. And of course, if the psychometric tool can be used um, also by um, third parties by other um, providers if they want. Are they, are they in the form of open educational resources? Evanthia, Peter, uh, Giri, who would like to uh, answer first? I think I could, Theodore, take, I could oh. please, please, Peter. I was only going to say I could probably answer the first question, which is that um, I don't think that there is any difficulty in adapting uh, and, in, and changing the content. And indeed, the content is different across the different countries. However, um, if we change the content, then there will come a point at which we will need to get the, in, the certification, the validation process reviewed. Um, so, um, so I think the content can be changed quite freely. But um, the certificate that goes with achieving the elder care project might not cover that. Uh, Ava, I think you might be in a better position to ask the answer as well. 
Thank you, Peter. Yes, I agree. Uh, for sure, the content uh, could be adopted uh, in vet providers that would like to adopt it. Of course, it's open educational resources, so uh, it's free to, to download the, the course and uh, adapt it to your context. Uh, every country has its own legislation, uh, so you can be aware of that. Um, some skills are, are horizontal, uh, since I had a question for a GDPR, uh, as I saw. Um, so you can transfer uh, some soft skills, for example, you could use it in other curricula as well. But this curricula, uh, per se, could be adapted to, to the environment of some other uh, providers or uh, to the specific country. You should be aware that the certification is for this structure of the, the curricula. So you will may need another certification, but you can, of course, adapt it. Um, I don't know if um, regarding the uh, certification accreditation, Aquin would like to raise a point at this moment since they were also participating in the project and responsible for the uh, issuing of the accreditation. Uh, please, the administrators, uh, unmute Mrs. Yorina Marazzi. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, hello, thank you very much for the welcome. Um, I think that Eva and Peter have covered us, so there are no further comments from our side. Thank you. Okay then, um, if, um, if you want, uh, you can use the training material. Um, you can contact um, either the lead partner, um, ACME, through Evanthia Vaiuli or one of our members, one of our partners in the, in the project. And uh, we will happily um, transfer you all the training material and also help you during the adaptation of the material in the country uh, specific context. Saying that, I would like to end this uh, first part of uh, the event. I hope that um, you will um, be here with us for the very interesting second part, which uh, will start at um, 12 at 12.05 uh, uh, Central European time. It will be very important to be here because we are having um, two very interesting um, um, presentations about the informal and the formal uh, sector and their insights and also um, we are going to have uh, from H platform um, um, a presentation of the ongoing policy processes at the EU level regarding the long-term care. So um, see you again in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, welcome back to the second um, part of uh, our today's event. I would like to um, welcome <coughs> and uh, give the uh, floor yeah. to uh, Mrs. Claire um, Champé, Policy Officer at Eurocarers, who is going to provide us insights from the informal caregiving sector, especially under the light of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Claire, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, um, hello everybody. First, I would like to, to thank the uh, organizer for inviting us today. I think it's uh, extremely important and um, timely that our paths cross at this very important and particular time for long-term care, uh, which is um, dramatic, but at the same time uh, presents the many opportunities for systemic changes. So um, my name is Claire Champex and I'm working at uh, the Eurocarers um, European Network um, as policy and project officer. So I'm dealing both with some projects and also with uh, policy development happening in the, in the area. Um, I will briefly take you through um, our organization and uh, our um, insight in relation to training, which is um, one of our main in area for interest for carers. Um, and I, I must say, I would like to congratulate the Healthcare team for this project, which uh, looks uh, really <laughs> impressive what you have managed to achieve. 
<clears throat> uh, we have been involved in different projects in relation to training and we know our, our difficulties. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can yeah, see it. Okay, okay, great. So first, some words uh, quickly. <laughs> If you just uh, maybe could um, open it in a full screen, if you press F F11 or yeah, or, or this button, yes. Thank you. You see it in full? It didn't work, so let us continue like that. It's okay. It's oh, uh, I I think I might worry about that. You should see it full now. Do you? Yes, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. okay, great. Um, our network is um, gathering uh, 70 organizations across 28 countries, and we gather carers' organizations or inform informal carers' organizations and uh, research organizations working on care and caring issues. What we advocate for mainly is uh, promoting the needs and the added value of informal carers at the EU level and advocating for choice. We believe that uh, both informal carers and families and friends and relatives should have the choice uh, either to provide care or not. And if they want to be uh, caring, they should be supported to be enable to, to provide good quality care. Uh, we believe also this, is, this should be a choice for elderly people to be provided care by the family or not, depending on their situation. So we are very much advocating for recognition and choice. Uh, we define a carer as all these persons who provide care, usually unpaid, so it can be accompanied with some benefits in some cases to someone with chronic illness, disability, or any other long lasting health or care need outside of a professional or formal uh, framework. And we insist that it can be families, but also friends, neighbor. We have a very large definition of, of informal care. Um, as it has been mentioned earlier, um, informal carers, who are they? Mainly women, uh, mainly women of middle age. And importantly, um, people who face a series of difficulties, an increasing pressure uh, for uh, providing informal care that is um, more and more complex and difficult. I mean, with the aging of the population, um, life expectancy brings is, is a positive development, but it brings also uh, comorbidity and uh, care that is more and more complex to provide from a health perspective. Also, a huge price to pay often in relation to uh, participation in training, employment, <clears throat> progress in a career and a clear correlation between carers, caring responsibilities and um, employment related difficulty with and social exclusion and an impact also in terms of um, mental and physical health. And the feeling very often expressed by these carers that you save a lot of money to society, you but you, have, you feel a complete outsider. You have no um, consideration, no recognition, and you feel that you have no social life in a way. Um, also a clear correlation between a difficult social, social and economic situation of people who are providing regularly care to someone and um, in terms of health, in terms of financial difficulties, in terms of loneliness, in terms of life satisfaction and social inclusion, especially when these 
people are not participating in employment. What do carers want? I think it's important to realize that um, in most cases, informal care is taken for granted, is invisible, and is part of a kind of uh, hidden, silent consensus that it should be done. And informal carers want this to be discussed. They want to have a debate about uh, their contribution um, and how is it happening, how is it supported in society. They want this to be public and they are part of the carer movement which exists at the international levels, which is about um, having a democratic debate about care and caring and how we organize it fairly in our society. Um, as you carers, we, we propose a strategy in 10 points uh, that can be, that should be implemented both at the EU level and at the national level, which is already um, in, as inspired um, development in different countries, including in Belgium, <clears throat> which should first start by defining and acknowledging carers, identifying carers, assessing their needs, and providing them with a series of supporting tools, uh, community-based care, information, um, respite care, and importantly, um, training and lifelong learning. Above all, it's about adopting the carer's perspective in all policies that have a bearing on their lives. Um, as I mentioned, we are very interested in training, obviously, and we have been involved in different uh, transnational projects in relation to training for informal carers. Uh, and also, this is importantly based on the, our members' work on the ground, which is very often um, about delivering information and training to informal carers in, a, in the field. Um, we have been developing different training modules for uh, carers, but also for professionals um, in relation to how they engage with informal carers, how they can cooperate with them, because we believe that there will be no um, qualitative care, which is a positive experience also for the informal carers without uh, a good cooperation between health and care professional and informal carers. Um, from our experience, we um, have a series of kind of recommendations for training um, for informal carers, um, they, they, which should in a way, they are, a multiplicity of needs that um, must be addressed through, through training, uh, information, the need for um, acquiring caring skills, um, the need to reinforce people's transversal skills, also because when you are an informal carer, there are lots about, uh, as, as you already providing in LD care, ICT skills, but also transversal soft skills in relation to uh, how you organize your time, how you coordinate as uh, a multiplicity of intervention for the, the, your relative, uh, how you manage also the stress and the pressure. Uh, there's also a, need, a series of preventative aspects to be uh, addressed in relation to uh, how the informal carer can uh, prevent um, is her situation to be detrimental to, to his uh, health, physical and mental health, uh, and also how um, he, together with the person he's providing care to, he or she can remain included in society. Um, for all this needs to be addressed through training programs. We, um, 
We suggest a, a series of key components for successful training that are addressing informal care needs. Uh, first, they should be accessible and flexible. Uh, being a carer is having a life where there's a lot of uncertainty, so you shouldn't be daunted by uh, too strict um, rules for participation, etc. So you, you need to think about something that is really uh, flexible um, and that can be uh, followed according to one's rhythm. Uh, here, the potential of ICTs is enormous provided uh, informal care as supported in accessing ICTs and also supported that, uh, provided that the uh, their approach is blended. So it's very difficult to be participating and remain motivated only online. And as much as possible, what is the most efficient is an approach that is mixing face-to-face, -face, so really um, meetings based with one individual meeting or groups meetings with the use of uh, ICT for training. Importantly, you need to think about how you reach out to carers because very often uh, carers are very isolated and even not aware of their needs. There's such um, representation that informal care is something normal and that feeling lonely and stress is just normal, that it's difficult for some people to realize that yes, they, sh they are entitled to, to some support and some tra training. What is working very well, we have seen, is also that training is, in is integrated within a set of supporting services. Informal carers are not going to go for training for one day to another without any um, framework supporting them to do so. So it's working well with, when you have a set of um, services in a care organization, for example, ranging from uh, advice, information, respite care, and also suggesting training. It should be tailor-made because the needs are very, very different. The profile are very different. Importantly, it should be co-designed by carers also, so that they really it really addresses the, the expectation, their needs, which are sometimes difficult to foresee. Um, one thing that is working very well also within training is peer support. Carers are working very, um, are, um, appreciating very much uh, the possibility to engage with experienced carers and are learning very much from uh, others' experiences. Um, importantly, we'll think also uh, of training as a way to bridge the gap uh, that I mentioned between professional and uh, informal carers and provide for some shared understanding, shared terminology and a, a mutual understanding of um, each other representation and, and expectation. I think for training to be successful, efficient, it has to be identified clearly as objective. Um, some trainings can um, be provided only for the sake of improving the caring experience. Um, for people who are not at all in a pathway towards work or social inclusion. And that's only one important objective. And some of them may have um, an additional objective of social inclusion, skills, validation, recognition. And this might um, lead to a different form of training, which might be a little bit more um, demanding um, and also have has to uh, address this difficulty of validation of and recognition. I think it's really an achievement that LDK managed to get this uh, um, validation. Um, we experience very often uh, an important difficulty also, which is um, around the formal recognition of such um, informal training in the formal um, education system. Because I think if we want to really provide 
informal carers who need um, to be supported towards employment, uh, it would be very important that the training that they can follow, that they achieve, is recognized formally in the formal education system as a piece of um, a formal education towards uh, care um, employment. And our, we explore this in one of our projects and the reality is that um, with some exceptions, member states have seldom put in place a process for recognition and validation of uh, non-formal uh, education in place properly. Um, I would thank you for, for your attention and I really um, believe that um, working together is, is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, indeed, the inclusion and uh, the participation of informal carers in the, um, in the caregiving sector is very important. Um, the intention of the Elder Care Project from the very start was um, to provide a pathway um, to upskill and also validate um, prior learning of um, the informal caregiving sector. We hope that we have done that in, uh, in terms of uh, the two curricula that have been accredited and uh, can be provided and also lead to a certification um, towards uh, this direction. Of course, this is only one step. You have mentioned more steps uh, that should be um, undertaken in the very future. And uh, I do believe that um, within this uh, context, uh, we should elaborate our uh, cooperation in the future. Thank you very much for uh, participating today. And uh, by saying that, I would like to give the floor to Vera Khushakova from Senekura, from the Czech Republic, who is going to provide us um, insight, insights from the formal caregiving sector, since um, Senekura is one of the leading um, providers of um, care services for the elderly across the uh, European Union. Um, Vera Khushakova, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you all for the invitation. Uh, I must apologize on the beginning because my, uh, my camera is not running well, so I let it so and I share only my screen. I hope it will be okay. So, I hope you see it now. Yes, if you can share the full screen version, it would be better. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I would like to start with a short uh, presentation about uh, Senekura and myself. My name is Vera Husakova and I am the country CEO of Czech Republic. As you said, uh, the biggest private provider of uh, uh, residential services for elderly and people with dementia. We uh, are part of the Orpea group, uh, which is uh, covered now in 22 countries over the whole world. And uh, in Czech Republic especially, we provide now services for 2040 uh, residents and uh, divided in 16 uh, facilities. Uh, we employ now 1,200 people in Czech Republic and our focus is to constantly improve the quality of care and be part of the Czech Republic market because the main uh, it's now um, fulfilled by the state's uh, facilities and uh, to be a part of private provider in Czech Republic it's for us a challenge so in this meaning. Uh, because the time it's COVID time, I uh, put the main uh, focus on the last 12 or I would say 15 months and the changes which was happening in our facilities and uh, also in our lives. I 
hope or I mean uh, the situation it's uh, the same by all of you so our daily lives it's changing and uh, it was changing and it was big challenge for everyone and I would say the main target group who was uh, practically attacked was the elderly people uh, not only the elderly in facilities also the elderly at home and uh, what was for us the main uh, change was this part by the philosophy of Senecura to provide the care like uh, open homes. We were in the past really proud that uh, we invite everybody and everyone during the day and we were really like a part of the community. Our expectation was also to combine the uh, the children and the elderly to find also the, uh, the ways how to work with uh, communities and to be part of the cities and, uh, and the structure of, of the community. But uh, this has changed. The main target became minimize the risks of COVID infections and it influenced everything and every life and not only uh, our clients and residents but also the families of them and also and mainly also the employees of the facilities. I think this uh, was happening in all facilities not only in Senecura facilities and um, it follows because the follow rules stay over one year and are not changing so much. So what we learned was we wear a mask and cover snows and mounds, we keep distances. It means distances not only by the employee and residents, we keep distances also by the visitors and families and uh, it makes not the life uh, easy. And uh, the all disinfections process, indoors refreshing, screening, disinfection surfaces, test clients and employees. And the main behind this was minimize the risky contacts, including postpone unnecessary doctor visits. That influenced the life of the uh, visitors and residents and also employees a huge. Uh, what we see and what was the main challenge uh, for us on the beginning was how to work with, uh, I would say, the main, and this was fear. Uh, the main target was for us as a management, bring safety and trust by managing risks and uh, clear rules how to work and how to recognize new situation because our description of the situation was the care is how it was. This what is changing is what you wear and how you must work in case of um, basis care and in case of safeness. It brings us many trainings and safety techniques and IT techniques. And uh, it was on the beginning of the first world where we see that we were not prepared. We had not enough of equipments and available uh, protection equipments and also knowledge. The knowledge was on the beginning something what brings us the fears and uh, it brings also fear for the uh, employee for the clients and also for the families. Uh, for us it means or it was the target uh, to learn how to work in change and eliminate this fear and make many trainings in very difficult situations, in very difficult uh, working uh, rules because the groups must be slow uh, small groups and divided groups and the people cannot touch together also the information uh, going through the facilities must be changed and the way how we discuss and how we follow with the information was changing 
many things which was running personally was running newly by the online uh, we used more online uh, sources and uh, we really uh, try to eliminate this risky uh, contacts uh, one big big uh, change was also to be able to uh, provide professional psychological support uh, during our uh, spokes with the employee and also with the clients it was new situation it was uh, about loneliness it was about fear and we try to find out what are the main reasons for it and to work on this uh, we try also ensure uh, to be clear at the end of last year about the changes because the first world was for us very successful uh, in main of Senegura and at the end uh, also over our rules we get uh, corona in our facilities and we get in contact with deaths and it was not easy also for the families also for the clients and also for the employees the one point which was for us something like coming out it was that uh, normally if the client is um, leaving the life or it's uh, it's that we really have a very nice um, uh, engagement and a contact with the families and uh, uh, this was not possible and this was something what uh, was very influencing the psychical status quo of the employees and also of the of the families and this was a very big point to work with professional psychologists which are going to our facilities and have uh, the interviews with our uh, with our uh, employee and also we get this possibility to our clients if the families need it we get the contact to them and we support them in this way uh, i would say the, the the next main target was ensure fast and regular reliable testings which we did and which is running also today it's it's mainly the way how we can avoid uh, Ill, um, to be alone and not to have closed doors for for the visitors today we also organize flying teams because uh, the fear was what we do if uh, more uh, our employee will be also infected and how we make sure that the basis care will be done and I was very happy and very proud of our teams that we had the people who were um, able and offer us to uh, take part of the care in other facilities in other uh, uh, cities and in many cases it means also to move from the family and to bring uh, or to uh, have a time for more than a week in other facility and other city and uh, really be prepared to take part on this flying team. Uh, for us it was also very necessary to ensure mental well-being of the people, of the staff. And uh, if you can imagine the main staff or 80% of the staff are women, which has families, which have children and have also fears about them so uh, they must be able to take care about the family and also to be uh, able to work on uh, our facilities or in our facilities and therefore we provide babysitting for them not only for the small children but also for the bigger ones we provide the possibility of taking lunch <clears throat> and meals for the family members uh, under favor of conditions and we also enable testings for families members that they are sure and have uh, can we eliminate these fears. Uh, this was happening the whole the year, also small changes and small uh, gifts. 
and the support also for the nation and for the people from around was really big and I'm very happy that we find the way how to learn to take care about our care uh, our clients residents and also our employees because without them we will be not possible uh, for the client was the main target that the physical distance doesn't have to mean the isolation or loneliness. We make everything and we try to keep residents involved and in contact and it brings us really new situations in case of equipment, in case of uh, training of our staff to learn more about applications, to learn more about IT uh, uh, tools and also to buy more tablets, iPads and uh, other IT techniques uh, which we also learn more for the client structure. Uh, communication which we choose for families and residents or between the families, residents and facilities uh, was videos was playing uh, video messages and also we make a YouTube live stream for family members and directors. Uh, in the next level was also the chief nurses uh, there. Uh, our project and our big success in the past was personal care visits, which was then make one online care visits. And we are very happy that we are now in the way to go back to the personal care visits where we can go through the care individually by client by client and also in the multidisciplinary team where take part uh, every uh, one time per half a year uh, and we discuss the care for every client which is in our facilities and we make it from the social uh, view and also for the medical view. Uh, but I am very happy that we slowly return to visit and to make possible out, uh, outings by residents because as you know Czech Republic is very uh, infected or uh, in situation that the numbers of uh, infected person in Czech Republic are around 10,000 people so we now uh, hope that our new way uh, will be to go back with activities for residents which are not individual and which we bring back uh, as a fulfillment of annual wishes which we done also during the COVID concerts uh, in the gardens outside uh, and canist therapy, hypotherapy and music therapy, virtual glasses and virtual programs which was really new ones and new way how to work with the clients and also use them as a training program for the employees for example for the program for uh, how feel the people with dementia and what they see and how they uh, have it with program of association of elder in Czech Republic and uh, we make fitness and rehabilitation programs individual and various testings and culinary weeks because eating was one and is still uh, one the main part of uh, of the happiness of uh, of the day um, we try and we hope that the new way will be the vaccination and due to the vaccination uh, we can successfully uh, go from the basic and really basic care to nor normal operations and we prepare us for back to the open home. I hope and we are looking really to join the garden parties with families and members, the candlelight dinners and the other programs which we have as Senecura exchange stays for the resident and uh, we hope really that the normality somehow uh, bring us the vaccination. We see it now uh, where the clients really are able to have this personal contacts and go uh, to the families back. And we hope that uh, at the second half of this year will be uh, a big step for us in the normality.
I hope that this uh, can uh, overview you what is happening now in the resident care and uh, what we are affecting with and what are our targets in the last uh, 12 or 15 months. Thank you for your attention and your questions. Thank you very much um, for your presentation and the insights from the former uh, caregiving sector. I would like to highlight um, the fact uh, that you have stated the problems um, that have been emerged due to the physical distancing and um, the depressing uh, part of it. Um, I would like to highlight the fact that our psychometric tool can be used uh, also in the support of uh, care professionals, but um, so we are encouraging you and we could also provide it to you as a result from our project. And um, I also note the fact that um, you closed your presentation with the word hope. Hope is uh, in front of us. Um, I think that most of the um, great times have uh, passed. And um, within this context, I hope, I also hope that uh, we will have better times uh, starting from uh, this summer. But uh, Vanthia Vayuli has asked um, to make a short uh, comment. So Vanthia, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Fyodor. Uh, before, uh, during uh, the presentation of uh, Mrs. Sambe, I would like to, to highlight, uh, actually, I was very happy that I saw some uh, elements of our curricula in the successful elements for, uh, for the atypical uh, caregivers curricula. And I would like to highlight the fact that it's very important to involve the atypical uh, and the typical, uh, in general, the caregivers, in the procedure of developing their curricula because uh, I think that sometimes they know better than the academics. Uh, in fact, in aid care, and I would like to mention that uh, earlier in my presentation, we have involved the sectoral partners uh, in uh, the development of our curricula as well, exactly in order to, to showcase the importance of uh, the role and uh, to take advantage of uh, their insights. And of course, it's very important to have here today both the informal and the formal sector. And I hope that uh, we have managed to, to bridge some, some gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, for uh, this intervention. Um, at this point, I would like also to welcome uh, Borja Arua Strain, um, a policy and project officer at H Platform. Um, who is going to present the reflections on uh, ongoing policy processes at EU, at EU level on the uh, long-term uh, care. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you, thank you Fyodor, and uh, thanks everyone. And thank, also, thank you also to, um, uh, to the LDCare project for inviting me and inviting H Platform Europe to be part of this very interesting conference. Um, I will begin presenting each platform and then I will move into uh, presenting our approach to aging, to long-term care and referring to EU ongoing EU processes, which we think are interesting for all our discussions and our, our work on, on long-term care. Um, each platform Europe, you may know it, many of you may know it. We are the uh, biggest European network of organizations of and for older people, so both organizations of self-advocates, organizations made up of older people that are fighting for their rights, and also organizations that are providing some kind of support or services to uh, older people. We have a team in, in Brussels, we have a secretariat in, in Brussels, 14 uh, staff uh, members, and from there we coordinate the network across Europe and also we do policy and project work at EU uh, level and we get for this uh, work we get, the, we get the financial support of the European Union and also uh, our member organizations. Our overarching goal and said in a very short way uh, is fighting for equality and dignity in older age. That's I would say the big goal we have in, in the work we do. Um, when it comes to talking about aging in Europe, um, well, we see different kinds of narratives. Uh, one of them is quite, uh, I would say, a negative, uh, problematized narrative around the fact that 
uh, aging in Europe is like a time, time bomb we, that we are confronted to a silver tsunami and that we have a demographic problem. So all these kind of catastrophical kind of narratives are quite widespread uh, in, in, in narratives, in policies, in public debates, in media. Um, against this narrative, we have a different kind of narrative, which is the one that uh, I believe LD Kerr has been using, and it's also the title of this conference, the Silver Economy Narrative, the idea that aging is also an economic opportunity. Uh, of course, in, in the case of age, I think we very much prefer the second narrative, which points to the opportunities uh, that may come out of uh, transition, demographic transition, that in any case is happening, and as such is actually a good news. Uh, but what we think is that um, it is important uh, maybe not to see only older people as potential consumers or generators of economic growth, but also to address the human rights challenges that we currently observe. And it's not because the share of people in older age will increase that we will spontaneously see a change in the attitudes that society holds around older age and older people, which are very often quite negative. I put in there just two advertisements that show the kind of ideas we sometimes see and we take for like, like normal, like, well, making fun of uh, older people or thinking that we can fight uh, aging somehow. So this is, uh, you will be very familiar with this kind of, uh, of messages and, and, and ideas. Um, they are deeply rooted in our, in our um, common wisdom in societies and we really need to challenge those. And that's the role of NGOs like, like mine. If we do not do that, we may come up with policies that are not the right one, or we may, may come up with approaches to aging that are too narrow and do not capture the, you know, the whole variety of uh, situations and all the diversity older people actually represent. We say that older age, if, some, if anything, is actually a period of life where we are more diverse. And what about long-term care in the, in, the, in the picture of an aging Europe or in a Europe where demography is changing? Uh, well, there are several challenges, as we all know, and uh, well, in the conference, many have been already mentioned. We see a clear gap uh, in access across the EU when it comes to long-term care. Um, so if, this is a figure that comes from a European Commission uh, discussion, discussion paper. Um, so this shows the percentage of older people with uh, self-reported uh, needs, uh, moderate or severe, who actually have access to care. And if you look at the figure, actually only two or three countries are doing relatively well, uh, but in most of them there are huge gaps uh, in access to, to care services. In many of them, we are talking about between 70 and 90 something percent of gaps in access to uh, care services among those that report to need care services. And we are talking here more about long-term care and social care. Um, so this is a clear problem that Europe has to address all member states and also the EU as that. We know also that there are many quality issues. Uh, we are confronted to a landscape of services that often are outdated uh, and we see overall quite a clear lack of prioritization of uh, social services and long-term care. Also actually in the context of this crisis, social services at European Union level are working hard for this to change. But we know that there is a tendency to think first of healthcare and then we think about maybe long-term care and social services. Um, so what we saw in COVID, and this comes from a New York Times article about the situation in Belgium, but these uh, media reports, have, we can find them for different contexts. What we know is that COVID-19 has exposed the consequences, the most dramatic, tragic consequences, the ultimate consequences of deprioritizing long-term care, underinvesting in, investing in long-term care, and keeping uh, long-term care services and models that are actually outdated or that they rely too much on, uh, on old models of, of care delivery. Um, and this is a figure that uh, we found uh, last week that Euro found the European Union um, Foundation that is resp responsible for uh, analyzing, researching, investigating um, working conditions and living conditions in the EU. They found this figure. Uh, about wages in the long-term care sector in social services and they found between 20 21 percent um, of uh, like wages are in the sector 20 21 percent below uh, national averages and if you make the calculate the eu average you have the same number 20 21 percent less well paid or be below the average uh, compared to uh, to to the national averages so 
uh, we have a problem also in the way we are valuing and, and, and paying for jobs in the long-term care sector. Um, and also traditionally, we have been confronted to a challenge is the fact that uh, we often focus our discussions and policies very much focus on the services as such, how they are structured. And we do not actually think of care, of needing care as one aspect of life among many other aspects of life. We tend to reduce people in need of care to only that aspect of their lives. Care recipients as if receiving care was the only aspect of people's lives. And we should never lose sight of the fact that uh, citizenship is something we should enjoy from the moment we are born to the moment of the end of our lives. And that means that care is a support to continue enjoying your citizenship rights. I know that in many situations, people may have very, very serious care and support needs, which may make this look unrealistic or impossible. But if we start from thinking this is not possible, we will certainly never get there. If we have this ambition, if services have this ambition, and if skills actually of professionals are oriented towards supporting people to remain integrated and participating in communities, we may start making some steps, uh, steps forward. So we should start rethinking what's the role of long-term care in people's lives and really not seeing it as the only aspect of people's lives, but seeing it as a support uh, for, uh, for their uh, citizenship and their continuous participation in society in equal footing with, uh, with others. Here I come to EU action on long-term care. So is the EU actually doing anything? Is the EU actually capable of doing anything in long-term care? If you take uh, legal texts, if you lay, take uh, EU treaties, clearly long-term care, as most aspects of social policy, is mostly a national competence. So we cannot expect the EU not uh, immediately, let's say, to uh, be the main actor in organizing legally or in terms of policy long-term care across the EU. That remains a national matter. And yet, there are a couple of uh, instruments, and we are in 2021 in a key, key moment in this regard. There are a couple of instruments that have a clear impact on how countries, or that can have a clear impact on how countries approach long-term care and aging more widely. The Vice President uh, Suiza at the beginning of this conference referred to the Green Paper on Aging, which uh, puts forward some uh, key questions uh, for stakeholders to respond by the 21st of April. Everyone can do it. We are working in my organization on submitting our own contribution to the, to the consultation. The Commission is putting forward some key questions on uh, how to address demographic aging, including actually in the field of long-term care. And they put the stress quite a lot also on access to services in rural environments. We know that access can sometimes be easier in urban environments with uh, thicker social networks and, and social services. And we know that there's been a tendency to, uh, I, I, let's say, eliminate and reduce access to public services in rural areas. Well, this is part of the questions and the responses that we can give to the consultation, hoping that on the basis of these uh, inputs we share with the Commission, the Commission will be putting forward some uh, initiatives uh, to respond to address uh, these, uh, these inputs. So I think it's worth uh, responding to this, uh, to this process. Second, the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Uh, as we all heard, the European Union put forward uh, so much money to address uh, the recovery from COVID-19. Uh, this is uh, about around 750 billion euros. That's uh, it's a huge amount of money that will add to the usual um, a multi-annual financial framework, which is the budget of the European Union. So there might be something, there should be something in there for social services, including for care and support for older people. And here again, uh, social services organized at European uh, level, including very prominently uh, the European Aging Network. They are fighting hard for uh, this facility to serve also uh, long-term care and to be uh, useful in the sense of better funding uh, long-term care. So this is a second uh, initiative or process at the European Union level that is worth uh, following, monitoring, uh, and also you can, all of us can follow what our countries will be proposing in terms of you, how they can, they want to use this money to make sure we have a socially fair uh, recovery from COVID. And the last point, and I will elaborate a bit more on this one, uh, is the European pillar of social rights many of you may have uh, heard of. Um, it's a set of 20 principles and social rights, um, including uh, specifically one right uh, to long-term care. And this is uh, textually what, the, um, what this right in the European pillar says. It says that everyone has the right to affordable long-term care services of good quality, in particular home care and community-based services. 
Um, Denmark is just a political declaration, but it's a political declaration of the highest level. Uh, here you have a picture of 2017 November, Gothenburg, Sweden, uh, where uh, all uh, heads of state and government of the EU, with some missing ones, but all EU member states were represented, where they uh, proclaimed the pillar, so they politically committed to implementing the European pillar of social rights, and we can hold them accountable uh, to the implementation of the European pillar. We can remind them that they took this commitment, at least politically. Recently, uh, week, some weeks ago, the European Commission published an action plan to implement this pillar. So now it's about moving from the, let's say, uh, quite maybe abstract, sometimes wording of, of, of the pillar to more concrete action. In the field of long-term care, I put in there the three aspects that are worth having a close look in the coming months. Uh, very soon, uh, that should happen before the, before the summer, the European Commission and the Social Protection Committee, which is a group where uh, the different member states are represented by other social affairs ministries. Uh, they will be publishing jointly a report on long-term care with uh, new data uh, about the situation in Europe. We hope we will have data in their fresh data on access, on uh, coverage of social protection systems, on measures to support informal carers, on working conditions, etc. So this report will be quite a comprehensive uh, picture of the state of long-term care across the EU. So I invite you to pay attention to it uh, and uh, to have a look when it, it will be out because it's a very useful tool. There was one in 2014, which was very useful for our advocacy. And in there, we will be able to see also what's the level of ambition of the EU and member states uh, in, in the field of long-term care in the coming years. The second is that the European Commission is pub, uh, proposing having new indicators at European Union level on long-term care. And specifically, they propose two indicators, one on public spending on long-term care. So they want to have a picture of, European picture of how much countries are spending in their public budgets for long-term care as a percentage of uh, GDP. And also they want to include the coverage of needs. So to what extent countries are able to cover the needs people report having. So these two can actually be very, very uh, important if interpreted in a current, correct way. So we'll be follow it, following up uh, with that. And also the last point is quite vague at the moment, but we know that the EU is proposing to have a policy initiative on long-term care in 2022. So let's see what the Commission is putting in there. We have some ideas uh, for that. We submitted them in the, in the consultation to this, to this action plan. We think we should have access and quality indicators at EU level, access targets as well. We should measure you know, what, what, what's the level of ambition we have and how countries are getting closer to that in terms of ensuring access to long-term care services. Plus, uh, putting forward a shared understanding across the EU on measures to support informal carers, uh, or integrated care working conditions, and also maybe uh, assess how the EU can further regulate the private uh, for-profit market in long-term care. Um, and we should be linking all this to, we believe we should be closing the gap with the disability rights strategy and to disability as such. If you take European Union policies on disability, usually they are more ambitious than long-term care policies. They talk about accessibility, participation, quality of life, etc. We think that the EU should be combining or linking the two somehow, uh, because we can benefit in older age uh, sector, there can be really lots of benefits between uh, if we close, manage to close the gap with uh, the disability rights uh, movement. Econ environments, I will not enter into that. It was uh, mentioned before and I'm already over time. I will just finish um, reminding the fact that at the moment, and that's an important campaign we, we are having in age, uh, there are discussions this week happening at United Nations level on the possibility of having an international convention on the rights of older people. We believe that having such a human rights framework for older age can be beneficial also in terms of policies at the local and national level, also in terms of services. It can be a guide to, uh, for services and policies in the field of older age and to ensure that aging equals to equality, to prosperity and to dignity for everyone. I will uh, finish here. I will be happy to keep in touch with you. You can visit our website or contact me in my, in my email. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very vivid, if I may say, presentation. Um, I have kept some notes. I would uh, like to highlight the fact that you have shown us how we start from a high level policy uh, decision and go down to an action plan and to concrete and coherent actions in order to implement a policy at the European Union level and bring it to the national level. I think this is uh, very interesting and we should uh, uh, keep that. And you have also highlighted the fact 
that we should all work together. We should work together, we should cooperate. This is something that I would like to um, keep from the uh, today's event. Um, I think that the fact that the major platforms, the major um, um, stakeholders have uh, participated in this event um, under the umbrella of the elder care project, but also discussing about where um, the elderly care sector is, 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 is going, is one of the aspects that uh, we should um, discuss, uh, that we should take with us, and also see if we could uh, do that in the future. Um, hereby, I would also ask everyone, I have placed again the, um, the evaluation form for the today's event on the uh, chat. Please click on it. It will be really nice to have some feedback. We are, al we are always uh, looking for that. Um, I don't know if there is any further question or comment that uh, you would like to raise at this moment. I think this is the opportunity to do that. Okay, um, since there is no further remark, I would like to thank very much uh, Samir Cheria. I would like to thank very much Marcus Espeter, um, who have worked and uh, are working at this moment um, as uh, our technical team behind the scenes uh, preparing everything. Um, I know that it's stressing to do everything right. Thank you again. Um, this is our team in Brussels. Um, and also, I would like to have a family photo, if possible, so if everyone would like to open a little bit their camera, it would be great, so that uh, Marcus or Samir could take some photos. Theodor, I also take the chance just to give a quick note. Um, our colleague Samir already uploaded all the presentations to our website. So uh, right after the event, you can now go to the website and download uh, the, the presentations which you are most interested in. Saying that, thank you very much for your time today. I wish uh, to all of you uh, a very nice uh, week and um, happy Easter for the Catholic Easter. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.